An alien lands on the ocean and starts terrorizing an island. Can the cop and his partner save the island from the monster? One night on Aran Island, a young fisherman notices a glowing meteor falling into the ocean. Along with his father and a colleague, they sail into the waters to check on it. His father reports the incident to the Coast Guard as a ship firing a distress signal. On the contrary, the young fisherman thinks that it wasn't a flare. Just seconds after, their colleague gets attacked by an unknown creature that drags him into the water. Seeing this, the father immediately orders his son to alert the Coast Guard while he goes to check on their colleague. Unfortunately for him, the creature stabs him as well. The young fisherman grabs an axe and heads outside to the boat to try to save his father. But he gets stunned upon coming face to face with the creature. Then, the son gets eaten. The next morning, an alcoholic cop named Sierra O'Shea unwillingly picks up a female cop named Lisa Nolan at the port. Lisa tries to be friendly by offering O'Shea a mint, but he declines. Arriving at the station, Lisa meets with the chief of police who warmly welcomes her. As it turns out, the chief is leaving for two weeks and he requested a substitute that will help O'Shea look out for the island while he's gone. He also notes to Lisa that half of the island will also leave for the show in Dungaree on the weekends, so she will have lesser problems to attend to. After their conversation, O'Shea tells the chief that he can handle the island alone while he's gone, but he believes in O'Shea's ability yet always being drunk makes the chief doubt if he will manage to do it properly. At the port, two fishermen named Patty and Tadig. Patty catches an unusual sea creature and shows it to his friend. When he inspects closer, the creature sprays a foul-smelling liquid on Tadig's face. Luckily for him, it's not anything poisonous or acidic. Still, he gets pissed at Patty and leaves. A little later, Patty takes home the creature and puts it in his bathtub. Going back to O'Shea and Lisa, they are on the way to the seaside to respond to the report about some dead whales. Earlier the same morning, a local doctor named Jim Gleason was walking his dog when he discovered several dead whales by the seaside. On the vehicle, the two talk about why Lisa decided to come to Aran Island. According to her, she just took the job to have some chill days without actually sacrificing her official day off. Hearing this, O'Shea tells her that she can definitely relax on the island. Arriving at the seaside, the doctor greets the two cops and accompanies them to where the dead whales are. There, they meet a very busy marine ecologist named Dr. Smith. But upon seeing Lisa, Smith drops what he's doing and introduces himself. Lisa asks what happened and he says that the whales are already dead when they got washed up on the shore. Additionally, the whales probably got their deep cuts from the rocks while they were being washed up. However, O'Shea feels something is not right about this phenomenon. Afterward, he and Lisa go to his friend named Declan Cooney at the construction site. There, O'Shea asks him for a favor to pick up the dead whales at the seaside. It is already sundown when Cooney and his men finish cleaning up the shore. Seeing that one of his men left a shovel, he orders him to go back for it. At this time, the worker discovers some unfamiliar eggs buried in the sand. When he picks up one of them, something grabs his legs and drags him into the sea. In his car, Cooney gets pissed off waiting for his employee and goes to check on him. Unfortunately, he finds no one. At the same time, at the Mars Lounge and Bar, O'Shea is having a drink with Patty. Lisa, who is currently staying at the same lounge, shows up to borrow an iron from Brian the bartender. Seeing her, Brian's partner Una teases O'Shea with Lisa. After Una leaves, Patty tells O'Shea about the creature he caught. But since Patty's drunk as hell, O'Shea thinks that he's just messing with him. Instead of dealing with Patty's drunken stories, O'Shea decides to apologize to Lisa for his behavior toward her earlier. Yet, he is too drunk to do it right and he passes out on Lisa. After that, Tadig is currently resting at home when a knock on the door wakes him up. Checking on it, he's surprised to see Cooney wiggling like a drunken man with his hands up in the air. Tadig's wife, Irene, 
approaches the door as well, curious about what is happening. Suddenly, Kuni drops to the ground. When Tadig attends to him, he gets snatched in the air by an unseen creature. Scared, Irene hides in the house while she hears her husband screaming in agony. She tries to close the path on the chimney, thinking that the creature will go through it to get inside the house. But it's too late, as the creature already makes its way inside the chimney and grabs her from there. Meanwhile, Patty goes home and checks on the creature, only to find it missing. What's left in the cage is only an egg. He then checks around and notices that his mirror is covered in goo. When he looks back, he sees the creature, which looks like a love child of an octopus and a squid stalking him from the other corner of the room. Then all of a sudden, it attacks and latches onto his face. Luckily for him, he manages to take it off easily and beats the hell out of it. The next day, Una gets a chance to talk to Lisa. Una opens their conversation by informing her that a storm is coming later at night. Then, she quickly diverts the topic to O'Shea and shares that he is already a widower. She's shipping the two cops together. And as a businesswoman, Una offers Lisa a bigger room and a bed for her and O'Shea if ever the situation comes to it. But Lisa respectfully declines and leaves. At the station, she wakes up O'Shea, whom she locked up in the detention room last night after he passed out. Shortly after, the station receives a call from Patty about the attack last night. After a while, O'Shea, Lisa, and Patty go to Smith, who's currently examining the creature. Patty turns it over to the authorities and calls the station, thinking that he will get some cash as a reward. He calls it a grabber since it grabbed his face when it attacked him. However, Smith doesn't want to call it that name. As a marine ecologist, he wants to give the creature a proper name based on its genus. The only problem is that Smith doesn't know the origin of the creature or anything about its genealogy. Patty then insists that they should just call it a grabber. Ignoring him, Smith shows O'Shea and Lisa something fascinating about the creature. He peels some scales out of the grabber and then wipes a wet cloth on it. To their surprise, its scales regrow instantly. Next, Smith pulls out its long tongue and deduces that it sucks off the blood of its prey like a leech. Patty immediately seconded his claim on that. That is the reason why Smith concluded that the grabber only needs water and blood to survive. After that, he continues to explain that the grabber is female and shows them its egg. Opening up the eggs, Lisa and Patty get disgusted with the sight of the baby grabber. A little later, O'Shea and Lisa head out. He is thinking that the grabber is somehow connected to the whale incident before. When they drive by the shore, they see that Cooney's car is still there. Approaching the car, they see that the keys are still there. O'Shea knows Cooney will not leave his car with his keys inside just like that. Due to this, his suspicions are starting to build up. Seeing Tadig's house nearby, the two go there to continue their investigation. Their search for answers leads them to the roof where Lisa finds tattered clothes. Smelling it, she notifies O'Shea that it has the same foul odor as the grabber. Lisa then pulls the cloth, and to their horror, they find Tadig's head. The two immediately bring the head to Dr. Gleason to run an examination on it. But the doctor says he can't do it with just a dead man's head in his possession. All he can say is that Tadig must have been mauled by an animal. Suddenly, Patty shows up and brings the two to his house. There, they find the place wasted with a very huge hole in the bathroom wall. With everything that they have discovered so far, they realize that they have a much more serious problem at hand. O'Shea and Lisa, with the help of Patty, try to locate where the other grabber is hiding. Lisa asks Patty if he showed the grabber to anyone else besides the authorities. According to him, he showed it to Tadig before. Remembering what Smith said earlier, Lisa wonders how it managed to reach Tadig's house. Patty simply tells her that it was raining last night, so the grabber got all the water it needed to survive out of the water. Just then, Lisa remembers that a storm will hit the island tonight, making them all prone to being attacked by the grabber. Hearing this, Patty reveals to them that he caught the female grabber in a cave near the shore. The three waste no time and go there to investigate. While O'Shea and Lisa enter the cave, Patty decides to stay outside. 
Shortly after, he discovers more eggs buried in the sand. Concurrently, O'Shea and Lisa discover the cloth of one of the missing fishermen. Wanting to know if there is someone in the cave, O'Shea tries to call them out, but instead of a human, they catch the attention of the male grabber, which is a lot bigger than the female. Seeing this, the two quickly run outside and drag Patty to escape. On their way back to Smith, the two cops try to get some help from the Coast Guard. However, since a storm is approaching the island, they cannot send help until tomorrow morning. With no other options, they just take the matters into their own hands. As soon as they arrive, the two light the female grabber on fire. Smith asks what they are doing, to which O'Shea explains that wherever the female is, the male grabber will come looking for it. Unfortunately, the fire just turns on the sprinkler system, causing the grabber to get wet. Patty realizes that they are now in trouble, so he decides to leave the room for a while. They immediately turn the water off and carefully approach the creature. Taking a closer look, they are all taken by surprise when the grabber sprays liquid on O'Shea's face and latches on his face. The three struggle for a while, but they still manage to remove the grabber away from him. Weirdly, the grabber seems to get weak and vomits some blood. Seeing the weakened grabber, O'Shea, Lisa, and Smith beat it continuously. Just then, Patty returns to the room. When they see him, they remember that Patty already managed to take down the grabber before. While it takes the three of them to deal with it, Patty did it alone and with ease. Smith thinks that it must have something to do with Patty's blood. At this moment, O'Shea realizes that Patty was drunk as hell last night. With that in mind, they come up with the idea that the grabbers do not like the blood that is intoxicated by alcohol. O'Shea suggests that they should just gather all the people and drink the night away. If all of them are intoxicated, the grabber will not dare to eat them. And when morning comes, they should just all leave the island and let the higher authorities deal with the creature. After that, the four of them, along with Gleason, go to Brian to include him in the planning since he is the bar owner. Unexpectedly, Una arrives and the group quickly stops talking about the grabber. After dismissing her, the group continues the planning outside. There, Brian asks how drunk they should be to survive. According to Smith, they should be at Patty's level of drunkenness. However, Lisa doesn't drink, so she is not sure if her body can handle that kind of intoxication. Instead, she suggests that she will not drink and will lead them when they are all drunk. O'Shea disagrees, saying that he will be the one to call the shots because he doesn't have the plan to drink. Hearing this, Lisa excuses herself and O'Shea to the group to talk privately. She points out that it will be easier for her to do it because she never drinks. On the other hand, O'Shea is an alcoholic and she doubts whether he can refrain from drinking. O'Shea knows it very well and that is why he tells Lisa that he is useless when drunk. Therefore, he will be more effective in the fight if he is the one to stay sober. At this moment, O'Shea gives her his hip flask and asks her to trust him. With everything set up, O'Shea orders Brian to prepare all the drinks that Patty had last night. Then, they test their theory first on Lisa. She starts drinking all sorts of alcoholic beverages and Patty's homebrewed whiskey. Shortly after, they take her blood and let the grabber suck it. Fortunately, their theory is proven to be correct as the grabber dies as soon as it drinks her blood. At sundown, O'Shea, Lisa, and Brian go to the church to convince the people to go to Mayor. They have a hard time persuading them at first because they cannot give a proper reason as to why they need to drink all night. But when O'Shea declares that all drinks will be free, the people rejoice and waste no time going to the bar. As the storm begins to pour, the citizens of Aran Island start partying and drinking like there is no tomorrow. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, the group rounds up their weapons. Unfortunately, they don't have a real gun. All they have is a pan, a nail gun, a flare gun, and a water gun from Brian. They cannot believe Brian for bringing out such a toy. But he explains that if they put gasoline in it and have a lighter ready, they can use it as a flamethrower. Realizing that he makes a point, the group, except for O'Shea, takes a shot before heading out to their positions. While the others are posted at every exit of the bar, O'Shea and Lisa are in the car to be on the lookout. There, the two talk about their feelings and discover that they like each other. However, as O'Shea points out, this is not the right time for them to indulge in it. A little later, 
Lisa tells them that she is sorry for the loss of his wife. Hearing this, O'Shea clarifies that he is not a widower. His wife just left him for another man. As it turns out, that is the reason why he became an alcoholic. Meanwhile, Gleason has to pee, but he cannot go to the restroom since people are making out in there. With no other choice, he goes out to do his thing. Just as he is done, Gleason gets attacked by a baby grabber. O'Shea and Lisa see it and immediately get out of the car to help him. While Lisa is taking out the other baby grabbers, O'Shea removes the one from Gleason's face. But it didn't take long before the adult grabber shows up and eats Gleason in front of them. They get into the car, but the grabber quickly gets on top of it. Panicking, Lisa accidentally turns on the siren. Luckily for them, it distracts the grabber long enough for them to run to the bar. Brian then picks up his water gun and asks Smith for the lighter. After lighting up the makeshift detonator cord, Brian goes out to take the grabber head on. However, it doesn't work the way he envisioned. Because of that, O'Shea drags him back inside. There, Brian tells them another problem. The bar is running out of alcohol, and the only way to refill it is if someone changes the kegs outside. Knowing how dangerous it will be, O'Shea dismisses the idea. Rather, he orders the people to move the party upstairs. At this time, they are starting to question the purpose of the party. The anxiety is increasing in the place. This causes Brian and Patty to fight because Brian is blaming him for bringing the grabber into the island. While all of this is happening, Smith heads out to take a photo of the grabber because he wants to send it to National Geographic. But the creature just whips him away into the sea, killing him. As it turns out, everybody inside the bar sees it and starts to panic. Witnessing this, O'Shea orders them to move upstairs for their safety. Just in time, the baby grabbers manage to barge into the bar. There, O'Shea guarantees the people that they are safe because the grabbers are allergic to alcohol. Time passes and the grabber is still banging at the door. Just then, Patty implies that the grabber must be following the scent of its mate that they killed earlier. And O'Shea has been vomited by it, so the grabber must be after him. To make matters worse, all of them are starting to sober up, making them more prone to the creature. Thinking carefully, O'Shea suggests that they should lure the grabber to a place where they can dry it. Hearing this, Lisa remembers the backhoe from the construction site. According to her, they can use it to lift the grabber into the air. And when the sun comes out the next morning, it will dry the creature to death. When everyone agrees to the plan, Lisa heads downstairs to get Brian's car keys from the kitchen. She also finds the lighter and Patty's whiskey and decides to pack it as well. However, when the grabber shows up, Lisa panics and starts shooting blindly using the nail gun. Unfortunately, she hits the electric breaker, causing the power supply to be cut off. She then uses the lighter to light her way back upstairs, but she gets dragged by the grabber. Lisa drops the lighter into a spilled drink and it results in a fire. Using a butcher's knife, she cuts off the grabber's tentacles and escapes outside. When O'Shea notices the fire, he goes out through the window. At this moment, Lisa shows up driving Brian's truck. As he jumps into the car, Lisa drives to the construction site, luring away the grabber from the bar. Shortly after, Brian notifies O'Shea that all of them managed to evacuate the bar safely. Arriving at the site, the favor seems to be on their side because it's not raining there. When the grabber catches up to them, the two go their separate ways. While O'Shea makes the grabber follow him, Lisa gets to the backhoe, but it doesn't quite go well according to his plan. Instead of following him all the way, the grabber attacks him using its long tongue, resulting in him falling into a pit. As the creature approaches him, O'Shea sees the barrel of flammable liquids. When he is about to shoot it with a flare gun, Lisa comes in clutch and hits the grabber with the backhoe. The vehicle then pins the creature to the ground. Assuming that they already won, Lisa pulls out Patty's whiskey from her jacket to celebrate. However, the grabber is still alive and grabs O'Shea. Thinking quickly, he nabs the drink from Lisa and pours it into the grabber's mouth. This causes the creature to throw him back at Lisa. Seeing this, Lisa quickly gets the flare gun from him and shoots the barrels, finishing off the grabber. Morning comes and the two walk their way back to the town. At this moment, Lisa returns O'Shea's hip flask to him. 
but he doesn't want to be an alcoholic anymore, so he throws it away. After everything that happened, Lisa decides to stay on the island with O'Shea. They also decide to adopt Gleason's dog and live together. The movie ends with the eggs on the shore beginning to hatch. Grabbers is surprisingly a good movie if you just want to watch a horror movie with the kids. The pacing is fine and the comedy is effective. Having drunk people face off against a monster is also fun to watch. Overall, this movie does a good job of delivering what it promised to the audience.